Greetings, everyone. My name is Weston Nakamura from Blackworks Macro in Tokyo. It is Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023 at Asia Markets Close. Welcome to the Market Depth Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. So today, we will get into some more of what's behind the market activity heading into what's become a particularly critical FOMC meeting later today. Um, but let's just take a very quick cross-asset snapshot out of Asia. Um, equity indices. We are in the green uh, across the board following the U.S. rally yesterday. Uh, Japan leading the way. The Nikkei is up nearly 2% uh, at the close. This is coming off of, um, you know, coming back from holiday yesterday. Um, although I wouldn't necessarily say Japan is back in the office as Japan wins the World Baseball Classic earlier today and thus there was more, let's just call it, working from the pub going on. Nonetheless, bank shares rebounded across the region. Um, Hang Seng, Hong Kong, okay, also strong, up 1.73%. Uh, at close and very notable is the high bore rate. Okay, so for those not familiar, the high bore rate is basically it's the overnight interbank rate in Hong Kong, um, and that spiked yesterday, Tuesday. Okay, so by 250 basis points to 4.14 percent, which was the large largest single day gain uh, on high bore since I think it's either the it's either the 2008 crisis if not earlier. Um, but today, that overnight high bore rate had reversed and has now fallen by 175 basis points to 2.4%. Crazy, okay? So the HKMA, the Hong Kong Mon Monetary Authority, they basically attribute this surge in funding as demand for local currency, um, you know, due to both like market turmoil and volatility, as well as like seasonal quarterly end needs. Um, but once again, this is another look, global rate volatility spillovers and multi-decade record intraday moves are being set, okay? Be it in Hong Kong overnight rates to U.S. Treasuries to two-year boon yields to 10-year JGBs, doing things that they haven't done ever or since Black Monday 1987 or since 2008 financial crisis. And, and over what? What current catastrophe, what cu current, like, calamity is occurring that rivals those meteor-striking events? Like, yes, there's clearly issues going on right now, but the magnitude does not reconcile the level of and severity of these market jolts, okay? So we're going to get into that in a second. Let me just quickly mention before I forget on the currency front, keep an eye on the Turkish lira, okay? It's now breaking to the 19 handle on USDTRY, while all other FX is barely worth mentioning in terms of intraday movements. But nonetheless, the lira at 19 with a 19 handle, and then just shorts coming in. I think it's like 400% increase on the week for uh, lira shorts coming in. And so if you start to see that tick upwards and lira hit like a 20 handle, it can get it can escalate very quickly, and you can see a you know another round of collapsing of the, of the currency. So over the last few weeks, uh, we have seen some insane market volatility, uh, particularly in the rate space, as I've mentioned. Um, and for those of you who have been following the Market Depth podcast, you're all well aware of. Um, the last few days has been no different, really. It's another 19% basis point move in U.S. yields yesterday. Um, though today, we're relatively speaking, we're dead flat calm heading into FOMC. But I've pointed out like the, there's several reasons for this, but one reason that's being kind of overlooked and perhaps the, the largest you know contributing reason is that this is largely like a structural thing. This is a legacy side effect consequence of central banks directly entering um, the sovereign bond markets and be, you know as the biggest market shaping whales to differing degrees respectively, yes, but Nonetheless, their prolonged presence has impacted market functioning um, as in it's damaged and distorted market functioning and market liquidity. And in some cases, like the Bank of Japan and the JGB market, it's just out, outright destroyed market functioning and liquidity and avail availability. And obviously price discovery because they're setting price, you know, 10-year yield price levels, right? So the problem is that these are government bond markets okay so they're supposed to be the deepest and most liquid and most stable and reliable of markets and when they're perceived and relied upon to have those characteristics and thus see a flood of flow suddenly rush in but instead they have very different and very thin liquidity profiles then you get these massive 
day-to-day intra- or intraday price swings and yield movements and to everybody's surprise because they're not supposed to behave like a small cap stock yet they are and then that volatility triggers further illiquidity and further volatility and it's vicious sort of you know feedback loop okay so see my previous videos on the matter they'll be in the description to this video um and really the kind of most extreme test case of this or example of this is the Bank of Japan and the JGB market. If you want to see what a truly distorted and completely upside down government bond market looks like due to central bank intervention. Let's just take a look at what the kind of real world market consequences are or have been, if you will. Um, so first, just take a look at CFTC's commitment of traders positioning on two-year U.S. Treasury futures um, by levered funds. Okay, so levered funds were short almost 1.2 million contracts um, versus being long about 500,000 contracts at the end of February. So heavily net short in terms of directional positioning bias, right, from the levered community, the hedge fund community. Then two-year treasuries went on this massive rally and yield collapse. And now the latest data shows that levered funds went from being short 1.2 million on the two years to being short 800,000 contracts and open interest is down. Okay. That, that is position exiting or force exiting. Okay. So I was joking with a friend, like, well, not really joking at all, but saying in, basically that you know during the last you know last week's like rate volatility right when we saw two year treasuries move uh, like plus minus 20 basis points or more intraday i was saying like okay well that's that's the sound of a macro hedge fund that just blew up or is about to right well it turns out that that was indeed the case so march 17th so last week brevin howard um for those of you who don't know it's a, like a 30 billion dollar um you know massive legendary hedge fund Brevin Howard uh, had grounded three of its rates traders after they blew up their positions amidst this rates volatility. Um, basically, when you know a big hedge fund does this, it's not so much like being put in the penalty box as it is like it's like a stop loss on the traders themselves. But that happened with the rates traders, who were I'm guessing were positioned short. Part of that, you know, CFTC positioning that you saw. That happened. Then the very next day, March 18th, Bloomberg reports that. Adam Levinson's Graticule Asia Macro Fund has been shut down due to losses from ongoing bond market volatility. Okay, so, quote, uh, Levinson's Graticule Asia Macro Hedge Fund has plunged more than 25% this year, mostly during the days after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, according to people with knowledge of the matter. His bets tied to front-end rates imploded and erased years of gains, the people said, um, asking not to be identified because the details are private. Well, okay, yeah. So, first of all, that's just a really big deal, okay, for uh, Levinson, right? For G- Gratical Asia to shut down um, and, and after giving back, like, years worth of gains just in this past few weeks alone due to front-end rate volatility. And then we have Saeed Haidar's Jupiter Fund, Sitting on a 32% loss this month alone, March alone. Okay, so, and that puts his year to date macro fund down 44% since January. Okay, mind you, this is a fund that was up almost 200% in 2022. Um, and the current losses are the, like the worst in the fund's history. And this fund goes back, it's been around since 1997. So it's been around through a lot, right? It was basically, I guess, 97 was born, you know, into. The Asia currency crisis, um, obviously dot com, nine eleven, two thousand eight, European debt crisis, all, all all this stuff, right? Obviously COVID and and, and, and throughout all of that, it's been around, um, and yet its worst performance since its inception has been in this past month. And why? Well, it's not just the, being necessarily short, um, you know, two years or front end rates, but it's the 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 volatility it's the both ups and down moves right like the you're just when you get volatility when you get the move index that's just spiking like that it's it's basically impossible to trade that um directionally you're just going to get chopped up in either direction and even if you are some mighty hedge fund with decades of experience being you know rates traders and all that you're going to get destroyed as you and give back all your gains as per what markets do like single stock bank stocks and all that? Yeah, that's important, I guess. But 
rate volatility is destroying and chopping things up right now. Macro hedge funds like blowing up. That's the not new, obviously. Like um, Baliasny, Bluecrest Capital, Exodus Point. Like these are all like funds that were legendary in trading macro and have just been blowing up um, and getting killed one after another. So what does this all say? Again, when you have markets that do not function as they used to and are being wrongly perceived to still be functioning as they used to, you get extreme moves and extreme price swings. That leads to panic selling. That leads to position exiting. That leads to funds blowing up, which then reverses course the very next day and then back again the following day. This is what comes of that, okay? There are real consequences of that. I'm not saying, like, feel bad for these people. I'm saying that the fact that these people, these funds that were able to weather the storm, the storm and trade successfully make a shitload of money throughout periods of volatility currently not only not know how to behave or to trade this, but are getting blown up and chopped up because this is an unprecedented era such that they cannot even uh, rely. Their experience is actually relying on their experiences is actually causing more harm than good. And so I have a feeling that there are many, many, many more funds out there that are getting absolutely destroyed um, amidst this rate volatility. Um, and the repercussions of their positions extend far beyond just rates land. Truly unique times. Now, going into FOMC. Um, with that said, okay, we once again have split opinions and kind of split markets, if you will. But um, split opinions wise first, right? That happened because of some last-minute changes that were made due to the recent developments in the banking sector, okay? So basically, when Powell spoke before Congress and delivered a very hawkish stance, we had, you know, nearly unanimous calls for 25 basis point rate hike in March. The March FOMC wasn't even, like, where the debate divergence was at the time. Then, almost immediately, we have this banking crisis and now we have Goldman and Wells Fargo calling for no change at in the March of OMC later today. And we have Nomura calling for a rate cut. Okay. Which is either genius or stupid. Um, now personally, I think that the FOMC will stick to 25 basis points because a, they need to continue to address the inflation issue. That's still very, so, so very much exists above their desired target levels. And B, to not add fuel to the fire of validating a banking crisis and undermining the steps that they've taken already to mitigate the issue. Okay, so this is just as, just as the ECB did last week. Um, now, note what I just said is what I think they will do, not what they should or shouldn't do. Nobody should care what I think uh, the you know FOMC should be doing or shouldn't be doing. I'm just saying what they what I think they they will do. Okay. Um, now, more important than the 25 or no change or cut 25, you know, will be of course Powell's press conference and how he conducts himself and what he says. What he's going to inevitably be asked questions, very tough questions. He needs to strike a fine balance between not being like completely aloof, you know, to that there's a banking crisis going on, you know, and as well as being still fixated on uh, inflation, right? So, like, that, all of that is really where, you know, the, the focus will likely be in terms of markets and what markets takeaways are going to be. Um, and ultimately, though, for me, I don't care what the FOMC actual decision is. I don't care what the dot plots look like. I don't care what Powell says. I don't care if he spills a bowl of hot chili all over his lap during the press conference. I care about red and green blinking tickers at the end of the day. Okay, I care about what the market response is, and that's that's it. And I'm assuming that everybody else does too, okay? Because we're not here for the guessing game of what some guy is going to say out of the Eccles building or whatever. We care about what our mark-to-market -market portfolios look like, right? So, green and red blinking tickers at the end of the day. With that said, it's my view that uh, a lot of positioning is about to, if not already, 
the, like is about to get kind of flushed out or cleaned out, as I just kind of described with like these macro funds are getting blown up and these um, positioning in just being one way short on rates futures at the front end getting cleaned out and all that. And so because of this kind of flushing out, cleaning out process that's underway and probably at its end, if not going to kind of reach its end at after this FOMC, It'll probably take a day or two, but we're probably going to now start kind of a new market market narrative and new positioning to to form from here. So that's that's basically my mind frame going into FMC. And remember, as always, Asia is Asia markets open is the first market to really react to you know the Fed chair's press conference because obviously U.S. markets are open and reacting to the policy statement um, and Chair Powell, but it's in real time scrambling. Again, there's pre-positioning. There's it's mixed in with market on close orders that existed before the FOMC decision even came out. So that last like half an hour of market, you know, turmoil or whatever happens or doesn't happen, it's not a reading on anything. Um, Asia markets open is the kind of pause and deep breath digestion of what just came out, and therefore the first real clean, clean read market reaction that's often overlooked, while the last 30 minutes of scrambling in, in the U.S. trading session is often way over-scrutinized. So watch Asia markets open tomorrow, as well as Bank of England decision for which a 25 basis point hike is currently priced in, because as critical as the FOMC is, particularly right now, it is never the entire story. Um, on behalf of BlockWorks Macro, my name is Wes Nakamura. Thank you for watching Market Depth. We will see you next time. Thanks. Bye.